Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Sutton. I am a Bay Area native, a landscape architect. I've practiced in the Bay Area for many, many years. And I've been invited by the APLD to do a little follow-up presentation on the Slow the Burn Symposium uh, from a few months ago to do a summary presentation on fire resilient landscape design. And I want to thank the organization for inviting me. I also want to thank the sponsors who are listed at the bottom slide. Please visit that link and um, see who they all are and let them know you appreciate their, their support of programs like this. And finally, I want to thank Cheryl Buckwalter, who's done an outstanding job of organizing all the presenters in the program, as well as helping me get through, get this one ready to go. Very organized. It just wouldn't happen without her support. So thank you, Cheryl. Shout out to you. So let me get right into the presentation. I was asked to talk about three things. Uh, first, just overview the landscape design requirements for defensible space zones and provide some examples of what does that look like. So I'll have to have a little of that. And then we'll talk about choosing plants for fire resistant landscapes. And there's a lot of parameters we need to cover and uh, caveats. And finally, some resources for both Northern and Southern California, where you can find some of these amazing plants. So there's three zones that you may be familiar with. The first one is called the ember resistant zone. And that's from the building itself out five feet all the way around the building. Uh, some organizations call it the uh, zone, uh, zone zero, but not everybody does. So it's the ember resistant zone. And that's important to remember because if you look at the picture at the bottom of the slide, that house is burning around the perimeter. And this is from a test, warehouse tests. And that YouTube video will take you to do more information about the ember resistant zone and how they tested houses and by lobbying cannon fire of embers just to see what would take. So there's some good information that's been tested that we're going to share with you. And what you need to think about when you're designing around that area is if a superheated ember, you know, like a softball sized, massive burning ember lands there, what will it, what will start and ignite? And if it does ignite next to your house, that's very often why houses go. And that's why this zone was actually created didn't used to exist in our fire escaping requirements. Um, and it grew out of a post-mortem, if you will, of some of the fires that started around 2017 and beyond where they've been getting much more intense. And often there are situations where the house is burned, but the trees surrounding, like the tubs fire, everybody scratched their head and said, how did that happen? There were even conspiracy theories of lasers shooting down and burning down the houses, if you'll believe that. So at any rate, people started looking at that and saying, oh, now we've got a different fire regime. These hot embers are being lobbed hundreds of feet, maybe even miles, and jumping the fire farther afield. So we need to be taking care of that. And they're actually, it's not that hard to do. Uh, Five feet around the structure, inorganic, non-combustible mulches, stone, gravel, et cetera, and hardscaping are the what's generally recommended. Uh, no combustible furniture, materials, garbage containers, trash, firewood, patio accessories, you know, all the stuff we put against our house because it's convenient there. So we want to get them out of there and move them somewhere else and keep it really clean. You don't want fire-prone trees right next to your house, especially if they catch fire and reach up to the, um, the uh, eave overhang of your house. Uh, doormats, none of those cute little fuzzy coir things, you know, the coconut fiber, they're great natural fibers, but not in these zones. So find something else. Metals is, is a possibility. Uh, fallen leaves and needles on the roof, under the deck, keep that area spotless. Um, and the no vegetation within five feet of the structure, is under review because some people have said, well, what about a succulents in a pot or certain plants that are really lush? Do we really need to not have any plants there? So no, the, no, the jury's still out on that one. And if you have any branches in that zone, make sure they're 10 foot clearance, both horizontally and vertically from your house. So go see that video. It'll really put this information in your brain so that you really focus on that first when you're doing your design. The next zone then is from five to 30 feet. And it's called the lean, green, lean, clean, and green zone. Uh, and it's a lot of maintenance and design. 
remove all dead grasses, weeds, plants, foliage in that area as well, leaves, needles, bark, pine cones and branches. Uh, mulch is, uh, fire agencies have a very specific recommendations, but there are some discussions about um, gorilla hair or shredded bark mulch. I'll say more about that later. And, uh, but you do need to use something to cover the soil because I'll keep the weeds down and the weeds are often the grasses, often are what brings the fire rapidly up the hill to your house. Uh, so you want to be choosing and properly maintaining, don't just stick them in the ground, what they call fire smart plants. And I'll say more about that and keep them healthy. And in this zone, keep them irrigated, design your system. If you have a water budget for uh, more than low water plants, this might be a place to maybe put a few in or maybe put in a little lawn if it's going to be used. A good place to put it, it it's a helps with your fire break. So stay within the water reg regulations, but make sure your plants aren't um, super dry in that location. And it's recommended that you group them into islands rather than have big swaths of plants um, and find creative ways to do that. It can look nice um, and you want some space. So they're disconnected instead of just one long hedgerow of plants that once one gets started, they just keep moving along. And the spacing is recommended that at least two times the height of a mature plant and more on a steeper slope. So we'll say more about spacing in a little bit. You wanna limit your trees, minimum six feet or even 10 feet from the ground. One rule of thumb is three feet above the height of the ground cover. So if you have a one foot ground cover, then three times that is three feet. But then if you have a two foot ground cover, it goes up to six feet. And of course you want those ground covers not to be something that's gonna turn into a torch and just become a fuel ladder. Firewood and lumber in this zone needs to be covered with a fire resistant enclosure just in case fire comes into the area. Because once they get started, if they do, then you've got ready fuel, you've got a bonfire going there. So you need to protect them and keep the embers from igniting them. Uh, under our decks, shade structures, awnings also, just like around your building, you don't want anything combustible in those areas. And if you have outbuildings and liquid propane storage, make sure they're at least 10 feet away from each other. And bottom line, maintain it regularly. Keep it clean, keep it tidy. Uh, and I will say about the mulch, we'll move on to the next one is, uh, what's the fifth bullet down here? Uh, some areas and where I live, they allow you to keep some, they recognize the value of natural leaf litter, oak leaves and so on. And you may keep about three inches to control weeds and erosion. So don't feel like you have to rake the ground bare because that actually isn't healthy for the plants, makes them more drought vulnerable. Uh, and it might uh, limit the fire spreading from the ground, but often the fire's coming in overhead anyway. So just to be aware of that and check again your local regulations to see what they will let you do. So this is from 30 feet to 100 feet. I call it the buffer zone. And if you have property that's that large, then you want to be thinking about it. And that area, I like to think of it as once you get 30 feet away from the structure, start to create what we would consider a more natural landscape. It's not a garden at that point. And, it, and if you're in the fire, urban wildfire urban interface zone or the WUI, um, it's very possible that you have a lot of native vegetation around and it's a very appropriate approach to blend into the natural vegetation. Really important to cut or mow all the annual grasses that are invasive, not native, especially, down to, well, that's what they are, um, to a maximum height of four inches. That's really important. And then taller native bunch grasses actually may be okay. I'm getting some feedback from some fire agencies because the native grasses can retain more moisture. They've got deeper roots. They do hold in the soil. And so if it's okay, and they're, you could just keep them clean though, don't let them build up thatch and treat them more like a shrub in sort of an island treatment. But that is something to look into in your location. You wanna make sure that the tree, shrubs and trees have horizontal spacing. So the shrubs aren't just underneath the trees. Scatter it around. Again, it's, we're thinking a more native landscape here, not your garden. And then vertical spacing between grasses and shrubs and trees so that you're avoiding what they call the, the fire ladder where things start and then they move up to the next one, they move up to the next one. And before you know it, everything's burning. Uh, again, maintenance, we talked about the fallen leaves, needles, twigs, bark, cones, etc. although some can be kept if it's okay with your agency. And all dead vegetation has to go, just get rid of it. And uh, there are minimum distances, but then if you look at the graphic, uh, 
then that's a common graphic from uh, CAL FIRE, uh, the Mar Fire Safe Moran, they all have this graphic that shows how the steeper the slope, the farther the distance, because the fire is going to come racing up faster. So you just need to give more distance to hopefully allow the fire to simmer down when it doesn't find something to launch onto. So those are the zones. But what does that mean in terms of design? It's like, okay, and especially when we're looking at that perimeter zone, that fire ember, um, ember free zone. And I found these two shots and I really think they show great examples of a natural approach and a more modern approach on the right, which actually, I mean, that's sophisticated. That could go into Architectural Digest magazine and it's great. Who knew you could do something so striking? And what you need to think about if it's a landscape treatment is think about the view from your house outside the window. And I bet that looks lovely. And don't worry so much about what it looks like looking towards the house, because as you can see here, it's got great scale and shape and repetition of forms. And you've got these pavers and the gravel. And it just looks like it's a great place to sit out and have a cocktail or some coffee and visit with your friends. So get creative, see what you can come up with. And with boulders and cobbles, I've seen lots of examples, and I'm sure you have too, where it just, you know, you have the Noya cobbles, the six inch to eight inch cobbles. Someone gets out there, the gardener, and puts them in a nice row and a nice row and then fills it in with gravel. And it looks like this little uh, artificial, um, it's not really a naturally looking stream. It definitely looks contrived. And this is what you want to ask for when you are or create depending on who's designing, who's building. You want a mix of heights. You want some boulders, you want some cobbles, you want some gravel and, you know, study natural streams and just see how the rocks collect on the outside bend and how you get these sandbars and start to make something that could be conceivably a natural design. It's very attractive. And then when you're five feet away, you can start tucking in little plants and give it more of a stream-like character and it can capture the runoff from your um, rain leaders and so on. So a couple of really nice examples. This one I came across in Bend, Oregon. I was visiting and I managed to sneak up the driveway. I hate doing that, but you know, I got to get my picture. And what they did is they built up the slope with boulders and uh, in Bend, the ground plane is all bedrock. So anytime they have any construction, they have to dig up these boulders. There's stacks of them everywhere all over the city and all over the construction zones. So they're easy to find and they make a great non-flammable stabilizing ground cover. It creates, see how you've got pockets of plants. So they're not all squished together and it looks very nicely composed. And if you don't have a slope, which where this one did, you can always just create a berm. And then you have a nice curb appeal. And when you actually get up around the other side, the paving does go up to the house, but that's not what you see from the street. And there are other ways to treat the paving too. What's missing here, as mentioned in my notes, if you sheet drain across, you could create a rain garden. You could get some lusher plants in there, maybe some carrots or something and get some green. Um, and it also helps treat the water running off the paving. So with that in mind, here is a small treatment. This is an Alameda where the owners did this themselves. They were really creative. And they took the lawn out. It was a square of lawns, silly little square of lawn in front of a, your typical little tiny Alameda house. And they built a little wall around it and they put the plants against the wall. And then they created a little patio and off street parking for themselves using permeable paving, which they really needed. And although they didn't do this for fire safety, it would totally be adaptable to that. Don't know about the pots. Again, that ties into whether you could have plants within that zone, but simple creative has a nice look. Here's something more modern. This is in um, the left one is Willow Glen, San Jose, where they created this beautiful curved driveway. It comes in and it goes out and touches the house with the stairs gracefully coming down. And as long as you kept the vegetation five feet away, might need to do some adjusting, adjusting there. Uh, it's just a very elegant, welcoming space, wouldn't you think? And it's made out of turf block, you know, those grids, and they filled the voids in with a very nice gravel. So it's very clean, architectural, and permeable. That's always a plus. But the only thing is that to be fire safe, they would need to get rid of those fences because we don't want wood fences touching the building where they could catch fire and then go up into the eaves. So you need to be using metal fences or find something else. There's a lot of other materials that could be used. 
And on the right, this is an example I got off the internet of some of the structures you could use. That could even be pushed up near the house because it's made of, of, of aluminum. So it's not gonna catch fire. It might actually melt if it's really an inferno. But the idea is we don't want the fire to get that far, right? We don't even want it to start. And of course, anything underneath needs to be non-flammable, use metal accessories, use metal furniture, et cetera. So lots of things you can do. Now, the one on the left here is in my neck of the woods. I live in Pine Mountain Lake near Yosemite. It's up in the foothills. And this new house, I, I was watching it go up, it's huge. I never see anyone in it. I guess it's a summer home for them. And they've created a very clean zone. They're the paving comes out to welcome you in, you go park on the side, some boulders and such, but it's very clean and in, in the location, it doesn't need to have a perfect hedge everywhere. And they've created a berm along the sidewalk and planted it with some plants. And I think it's very, very nicely done, very compatible with the house and the region as well, which is regionally appropriate landscaping is a good thing. Oak trees have been trimmed. The only thing is I think the fire marshal would not be happy with the juniper, although it isn't next to the house. So, but still a nice idea that you could implement. And then on the right, that's from the Fire Safe Marin website. Isn't this a nice entry? It's got the cobbles around the house. They've got more rocks near the entry to make a continuity from the design standpoint, some berms. So they've sculpted the space. You've got this nice pathway going in. And in that zone, the middle zone, they've added, kept some lawn and if you've got kids, if you've got dogs, if you play croquet, if you're going to use the space and it's irrigated appropriately, a little bit of lawn is not is, is going to fit within your MWILO budget and it's also very fire safe. So I found that one very attractive. And finally, from the 30 to 100 foot, uh, here's some examples of what that might look like. Remember I said it should look kind of like a natural landscape, more space. I wanna give credit to Greg Rubin for the one on the lower right. This one survived the cedar fire a few years ago. And what he did is he went through and he advocates for this. Don't clear cut, he says, get rid of 50% of the vegetation and turn it into kind of a strolling garden. So think in terms of I'll keep this clump, I'll move this over here, I'll create more space, we'll have a gravel path, there's a bench. You could just make it a nice little space, but by opening it up, uh, it, it lessens the, the tendency to catch fire and spread everywhere. And again, it did meet the um, criteria and it, it did survive a fire. So I really appreciate him loaning that to me. And then the other two are from, again, Pine Mountain Lake. One's at the entrance where you have a, on the right, they turned what used to be a big lawn into a cobbled stream and there's some scattered plants and it's very attractive. Again, let's work with our hardscapes and create something that feels natural and has a nice uh, fit with our native environments. And on the left is more of an average yard where along the street they put cobble in and they've scattered the plants and it could be a little prettier, but it functions. And, and that's part of what this is about when you're in larger lots. Try, think of, I've got the prettiest stuff around the house, put the money there, then some nice irrigated landscape in the next zone, and then let it just transition to nature. And we'll save more water and uh, have more fire scape, safe landscapes that way. So I was telling you, I really was mourning the loss of the foundation planting. I really did at first. I thought, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? It's just hard for me to wrap my head around that. And then I started looking at some of these ideas and I've seen some that my friends have done. And mosaics, add some color, get exotic with your materials, play with your hardscapes. The flagstone with the mosaics in between, isn't that amazing? There's lots of things you can do. A cobbled mosaic, uh, I saw things like that in Spain in the cathedrals, or not the cathedrals, more of the country churches. They create some nice little uh, cloistered areas. And then the wall, a friend of mine did the wall down below, and she had a concrete wall and then a fence on top of it. And she kept thinking, what can I do? And she's very artistic. And she invited some friends over and she bought all these tiles and they chipped them and she created a design. And all of that was hand done by, by my friend and her neighbors they had a party afterwards and that's just one piece of it it just looks like a jeweled garden it's beautiful uh, murals lots of things you can do with murals and and trompe and get people out there get an artist out there to do something that is really pretty to look at not just a bare wall and then finally find some fun and attractive metal furnishings there's a lot out there and 
using all these techniques, you can create some really exciting spaces next to the house that people want to spend time in. And if you don't like the idea of sitting on metal benches, I know it's kind of hard sometimes, bring the cushions out, use them, and then take them back in the house. You just don't want them out there and caught in the fire. So now we're going to talk about plants. Well, the first thing to say is uh, beware of lists. You've probably heard this before. And in uh, doing some research and looking at different lists and looking at people who do research about lists, it uh, seems pretty commonly accepted that all the lists that we have are based on anecdotal data. You have a fire, you go out and see, well, what torched, what got torched, what lasted, what seems, and then you have other criteria that, well, it could be it's fragrant and sometimes when it's hot, it'll burn. Uh, so there is some logic to these lists, but make sure that you're thinking about the fuel characteristics as the bigger picture before you just look at a list and pick a plant. Um, and the number one, this goes back to Greg Rubin, and I would encourage you to go back to module three and watch his presentation because he covers all of this and more. Um, and it's live fuel moisture content in our plants. When our plants are stressed in the wild, that's why our wildfires have been getting harder because of all the drought. The plants have been getting drought stressed. They haven't been getting what we would consider normal rainfall and they're going up faster. And uh, we need to be thinking about how do we get, keep a little more moisture? And he advocates, and it makes sense to me, um, that we do use your MP3s, rotators, MP rotators, and um, I was saying MP3, sorry. Uh, and, just lightly irrigate, maybe twice a month, like a light rain. You're talking about maybe half an inch, not a lot of water. It's not gonna be a problem for uh, water use. And in fact, it's not really, it'll help irrigate the plants, uh, but more importantly, it just, it gets into the plant itself through the stomata, it gets into the leaves and the plant, when they're a little more hydrated and especially natives, they're more, uh, they need less water to be more fire resistant with a little bit of irrigation from what I understand. So that is the number one, make sure you've, figured out how you can keep your landscapes just lightly irrigated during the summer. Uh, and if we have a really, really dry winter and, and if our fire season starts to become 12 months long, then we need to expand that to just year round. Make sure there's just enough to take the edge off those plants. Fuel load is another issue. You know, clean plant versus a plant full of dead dry limbs. The uh, manzanita to the right is in my yard and we thinned it out and we thinned out the leaves. It's beautiful. And we actually had had a very light summer rain when I took that picture. So really the bark looks great. Uh, and it was an example of, oh yeah, it hydrates the plants and you could just smell the moisture in the forest. Uh, compact plants are like presto logs. They just, they'll go up in flames. So you really want, again, to thin them out, make sure there's air circulation. It's better for native plants anyway, to have air circulation. Uh, horizontal, Islands, we talked about that. Avoid the fuel ladders, that's another thing. So, and then think about the plants as you combine them. And then the uh, chemical content, a lot of plants have different chemicals that can make them more flammable. And I'll say a little more about that. And throughout the year, throughout the season, uh, and the age of the plant, these characteristics will change. Uh, and Greg also emphasizes, he uses the word good garden hygiene. And I think that's absolutely, make sure the plants you choose uh, that you and or your client can keep them clean and healthy year round. So really that's, we can do everything right, but if we don't maintain, it's all wasted energy. And there's a couple of uh, links there for you. The Sonoma EDU plant lists is a great presentation on why plant lists aren't really reliable. So you can get more information on that. And Las Politas has some good information about fire and fire resistant plants and plants that burn, plants that don't burn. So I'm gonna say a few words about native plants and I call it the native imperative because I have, it's always made sense to me, but I've in the last 10 years been coming across more and more information and research that uh, native pollinators and caterpillar larvae especially uh, support the entire food web and especially birds and they have co-evolved with our local native plants. So our plants and our animals, and the example on the right is your monarch. Monarchs will only deposit their eggs on milkweed and the caterpillar, isn't it beautiful up there? Must have milkweed to eat. So if we want the monarchs to continue to thrive through the areas they're supposed to be, we need to plant milkweed. 
And that's just one example. But if we fill our gardens, continue to fill our gardens and our landscapes with non-native exotic, exotic plants, the insects will have less to food. Many of them are very specialized and can't eat anything but a few plants that are native. And it'll start to, there's a concern that we are gonna to start to see the food web collapsing, starting with just insects disappearing. And then eventually we're losing our pollinators. We can't rely just on the honeybees. They're not natives to keep the plant food chain moving through. And then the plants would collapse. You know, we'd have fewer plants, we'd have, uh, it, and it all moves upstream to where it can affect our survivability on the planet. So rather than try to explain it in more detail, please, please go to the presentation by Dr. Douglas Talani from the University of Delaware. You may have heard of him. He's an entomologist who has been studying the relationships specific of insects in the landscapes and in our and the potential for a long-term extinction of many, many, many species. Uh, and why do we care? Because it's all connected. Uh, it's, it's a food web and as things start to disappear, we are going to possibly see some more drastic uh, results. So what Douglas has mentioned, he's developed a list, he's, did, he's done the research specifically on butterfly and moth habitat plants. Host plants are the plants that they can actually lay their eggs on and the caterpillars can eat. And the birds need protein when they're in mating and rearing their young. The early bird gets the worm or the butterfly larva. They like squishy foods. They can stuff down the bird's throats. So we are going to see fewer birds and we are seeing fewer birds. So there are results already happening. Uh, so he developed a list of not only native plants that are excellent attractors for butterflies and moths and their larva, but that there are hyper-specific plants called keystone plants. And like the uh, Roman, think of a Roman arch and the keystone in the middle, it holds it all together. So the keystone plants are critically uh, necessary to keep in our landscapes. So you put a few in your garden or you put one here, you put one there. You don't have to bake the whole garden keystone, but we need to be using them. And there's lists I'll, on the next slide that I'll show you. Uh, and the other thing is they've adapted to wildfire and many of the natives, they need less water to stay hydrated, they perform very well, and um, it's, it's a win-win for everybody. So I'll get off my soapbox on that, but it really is important. Please look into it. So I just started to look at, I was asked to take a look at what would I use and how would I start to pick plants? So I started by, first of all, uh, the question of natives, I was asked, well, what, what is a local native plant? So I go to Calscape when I'm choosing native plants. I try to pick plants that have a, a map, a location map, and they have one for every single plant on Calscape website. So when I look up a plant, I see the yellow zone and see how widely distributed it is. This is yarrow, one of my favorite plants. It's a great pollinator plant. It's a great predatory insect plant. It's a great food plant, and it grows everywhere. And what this tells me, intuitively is it can grow on the mountains, it can grow on the valley, it can grow on the coast, it can grow in just about any environment north, south. This is a really resilient plant. So that's one great way as opposed to it only grows in this little tiny area. It doesn't mean you can't use it, but we want to plant resilient plants that are going to continue to be in our gardens and continue to be in our landscapes. Uh, I, so I look for broad distribution as I was trying to come up with a list of plants. And I use Calscape to sort on very low to low water, and I verified it with Wuckels, since that's what we have to use when we're doing our water charts for our submittals. Easy care, not all natives are considered easy, very available. And then excellent habitat plants. And you can see that when you look on the description of the plant, you scroll down and it'll show you the birds, the bees, the hummingbirds, uh, the insects. When you see one with all those icons, you know this is a plant that everybody enjoys in the garden, in the landscapes. And I also cross-checked my, my uh, recommendations with uh, FireSafe Marin and others. So I looked at a lot of different things and these were what I would call the winners of that, those categories. Certainly not every plant that you could use, but they're keystone plants according to Talani's research. And they have all the other criteria as well. And when I'm designing, I like to start with the keystone, pick a few that 
fit my aesthetic, fit what I'm trying to do. And the good news is oak trees, all the oak trees, but especially the canyon live oak and the coast live oak are amazing wildlife species. And they'll fit in just about any garden environment where they're, they're nor native to. Um, and then, you know, bring in some other natives. And if you have some exotic plants, if your client really wants to have Dutch iris, well then find an appropriate hired hydrozone. There's no harm in doing that. But that's the order that I would do. And then down below is the link for the National Wildlife Foundation's um, lists that were created by Talami with his research. So here's a few to start with and get into the Calscape and all the other resources and come up with a list of your top 12 or top 20. So what about plants to avoid? Well, again, it's all about how you care for the plant. Is it hydrated? Any plant can be fire prone if not properly maintained. And some of the plants with the question mark, some lists say they're okay, some lists say they aren't. So there's not a lot of um, agreement on many of these. So if you were going to just try to avoid something that's going to trigger your fire marshal to say, wait, you can't use that, you might stay away from those. Otherwise, and then first of all, go back to the list that they refer to and see if you can live with that. Uh, it can be difficult if you're trying to educate the fire marshal or whomever's reviewing the plans, if they've got a list that they're looking at, right? And some of the characteristics of a plant that's more likely to be fire prone, at least this is what people are, are um, deducing from the research they've done or the postmortems, you know, needle leafed blades and grasses, stiff, woody, small or fine or lazy leaves, but you know, woody, dry, small, uh, volatile oils, fats, terpenes or uh, waxes and eucalyptus has always been considered a real difficult tree. However, there are examples of some of those fires where the eucalyptus around the perimeter of a house or a neighborhood weren't, they didn't get touched by the fire. So it's not, it's the mechanics of the fire and design of the landscape, not just, and the house, is the house hardened or is the house safe? Uh, however, eucalyptus can burn pretty hot if they are, if they get uh, the fire underneath them and it moves up the, moves up the fire ladder. There's sap, uh, twiggy dry or dead materials, hair covered leaves, papery bark can catch because it's pulling off or, um, and they usually turn, if they, rather than smolder when they're ignited with a match, they actually turn into a flame. Uh, and Las Palitas did a lot of testing on natives and they said, you know, unless they're really, really dry, they, they, they actually don't. And catch quickly. And Greg Rubin did some testing. Again, it, he, he said it was anecdotal, but we saw the pictures and he hydrated his plants just like he would normally do. And he used a torch and he couldn't get them to light. However, if we put dried grasses underneath, it would light the dry grasses and then the plant would more likely than not catch fire. So again, that's why you keep your site clean. You keep the grasses mowed down. Okay, so now Plant resources, there are so many out there, but this is what I would start with. First, calscape.org, you can search by address. You can actually, it'll list all the butterfly and moth host plants per plant and how many species. So, you know, I, I encourage you to find other plants that you like. You can look at different cultivars and find plants that you're very happy with. Uh, and then Las Politas also has, plant communities um, that you can identify by your zip code. And depending on where you're lo located, you really do want to think of plant communities and make sure that you're in sync with the, the synergy of the natives in your region. The California Native Plant Society and Calscape is a website of theirs. Join your local chapter, get involved in the plant sales, learn more about native plants, because we really are advocating in this program, Slow the Burn, to really consider using more native plants and work with the native plant communities as best as you can while still having some creative license and again using some plants in your garden that aren't from the California landscape. For the Keystone Specialist Plants, you can find that, use that link also from the National Wildlife Federation. And if you're going to source native plants, it's really important to do these things. Make sure that the nurseries propagate them from locally harvested propagules and especially required, this is actually something you have to do if you're doing a restoration project permitted through the National Fish and Wildlife and other agencies. They have that requirement in the contract because they don't want the, the gene pool to get disrupted. 
organic practices with no chemicals and no neonics. Neonics are neonicotinoids. Um, and a lot of the native plant nurseries specifically say they don't use them, which is great because they really shouldn't. Um, but if you're not sourcing from a native nursery, you may not get that. And the neonics are systemic. They get into the plant, they act like nicotine, the animals, the bees, the pollinators get on the plants, they get it into their system and it can usually cause um, nervous system collapse and they die. So uh, need to find, make sure you have a good resource for your plants. And you can find those through the Calscape website has a list of where you can find each plant. And then Phytophthora, which is a mouthful, that is a fungus, actually it's a, a um, pathogen that is one of the species is considered the, uh, create, it causes the sudden oak death, but there are other problems with it. And native plants are very susceptible to that. And then you can have a whole group of plants die off. And nurseries have to follow that protocol with native plants if they're gonna be used again in, re in restoration, because you don't wanna introduce that into a whole stream bed. But it's good practice to do that in your gardens as well. Keep, keep nature happy and healthy. And if you have a larger project, you might even wanna consider a contract growing so you get really good quality plants and get your client to pay for it up front, uh, and you'll be really happy with the results. So there's a lot of nurseries in Northern and Southern California. Uh, nine nurseries are listed in the Bringing Back the Native website, plus a whole uh, plethora of um, wonderful information. They have the garden tour. But if you go to the Find a Nursery, there's about nine or 10 nurseries there that are from the Bay Area, many of which I like to use. And then in addition, the uh, nurseries listed below, the Bay Natives, Floral Native Nursery, Cornflower Farms is also a great website. All of these nurseries have great information. So just spend some time looking and learning and reading about plants, especially if you want to know more about native plants for your region. And then in Southern California, here's a list of a number of nurseries that you can find from uh, Las Palitas up in uh, Santa Margarita, I believe. They're up a little more northern of, San, of uh, Santa Barbara, and then there's some down in San Diego and in between. And don't forget the botanic gardens. Also, many of them have sales, and they are also a great place to go and see your plants in habitats. So that concludes my quick summary of fire resilient landscape design. I hope it was helpful for you. And again, I want to thank everyone for inviting me, the APLD and um, Cheryl and the sponsors. And I hope you find this uh, useful. Thank you very much.